Coming up on Pet Heroes, a search and rescue team scrambles to locate survivors in the wake of a disastrous earthquake. And a detection dog sniffs out danger at a major border crossing. Hi, I'm Jason McCoy, and welcome to Pet Heroes. Most of our dogs are pets, but many breeds were actually developed with specific jobs in mind, and we're always finding new ways for dogs to help us. Well, here are two powerful stories that show us why the expression working like a dog is such a compliment. Okay, you may want to consider, because it's dark inside, to use the light color on your dog as well. Sylvie Montier is the training coordinator for the Canadian Search and Disaster Dogs Association and a certified international disaster dog leader. Her family has a long history in working with dogs for search and rescue. My father was um, in the French army. He was a medical doctor and uh, they did have some, um, some dogs and they were Belgians. The French army had Belgians at the time. Sylvie grew up helping train dogs at home and it was natural for her to carry those skills into volunteer work as a handler for search and rescue teams. When she and her husband Richard settled in the Edmonton area in 2000, there was no group in Canada doing disaster search and rescue with dogs, let alone international work. Within a year, Sylvie spearheaded the formation of the Canadian Search and Disaster Dogs Association. Now all she needed was a dog. Sylvie knew specialized work called for an extra special dog. Her search for a canine partner was intense and eventually turned up a Lacanois, another type of Belgian Shepherd. I first met Kramik in France. I was looking for a dog. I had virtually people all around the world looking for a dog for me and uh, I got that one email for a dog that was in France and I went to visit him and I really liked him so I didn't hesitate, I took him. This particular dog learned very, very fast. He was extremely driven and he had some basic training already and this is one of the hardest things to find in a dog is the dog that has a good uh, work ethic and he had that because that was put in his head since he was a puppy so that made it very easy. But finding the ideal dog was just the start. From there, Sylvie had to train Kramik for difficult, dangerous work. Typically, you're looking at one to two years of uh, training, constant training. And I don't mean training like you take a once a week obedience class. It's really intensive training. The handler should be able to, uh, to look at his dog and know what the dog's going to do and what the dog is thinking. And vice versa, the dog can look at you, he just knows what you're gonna ask him to do, and he does it. It's just impressive when you work with a dog to realize how much they can really know and how much they can really understand. The earthquake has caused structural damage, collapse of material. Once each year, the Canadian Search and Disaster Dogs Association stages a mock disaster mission for training purposes. Participating this year are 19 teams from across Western Canada. This is part of our preparation for our team members to get ready to deploy uh, on a mission on any disaster site that we would get called to. So they have a good understanding of A, what they're committing to, and B, what they can expect if they hit uh, an affected area. A key part of disaster training is teaching the dogs to differentiate between the living and the dead. This is search and rescue, can anyone hear me? For the living, they bark. For the dead, they scratch and whine. We need to know whether we have a live person or not, because if it's a dead body, we don't have to move as fast to take the person out. Don't move, we'll be back. We're going to get help, okay? For the dogs, it's a game. We teach them to use um, already their innate ability for a reward. They work very, very hard. In January of 2010, a catastrophic earthquake strikes the Republic of Haiti, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. The call for assistance goes out only 18 minutes after the earthquake hits, triggering a massive international aid effort. Okay, I will. Sylvie's husband, Richard, confirms it with a phone call. So my husband contacted me and said, we've just had a red alert. So I went on a computer and I checked out. And sure enough, we had it. It's showtime. 
This is what it's all about for Sylvie, her teammates, and especially the dogs. It takes usually about 24 hours. In that case, within minutes, everybody was on the net. There were already a call out. So whoever could mobilize, please mobilize. So we knew that it was not only a red alert, but it was a very, very serious matter at that point. As soon as you grab your bag, and you are a little bit frantic yourself, so the dog feels it and they just know. He knew he was going to work. It's always a big race with time because the first 72 hours is the most crucial time. Getting to the Caribbean on short notice is a logistical nightmare. Sylvie and the team fly through Calgary, Houston, and Newark, New Jersey, and that still only lands them in the Dominican Republic. They're on the same island as Haiti now, but it's late and the team isn't able to secure a flight into the disaster zone until the next morning. Every passing hour means more lives lost in the rubble. We could see it from the air, the devastation of the city, the dust rising up from the city as we flew in. You could see it was massive. News of their arrival spreads fast, and before the team can even set up camp at the UN Coordination Center, they're whisked away to their first search and rescue assignment. On the way, we've noticed a lot of dead bodies. Some of them had a sheet or a coat over their face, over the entire body, and sometimes they were nothing at all. We could also see buildings that were um, all opened up and partially collapsed. It was really a sad spectacle. The team arrives at a school which has been left unrecognizable by the earthquake. 200 students are still missing. Really badly damaged, it was very unsafe. The order we had received was live only, ignore the dead. No matter when the dog was alerting on a dead person, uh, we had to leave it and continue pursuit for, uh, for life. So we worked and search and search, and the dogs could not uh, indicate anything alive. You have to find it within yourself when you do this kind of work uh, to put it in a, a perspective, a proper place, so that it doesn't affect that fact that you have a job to do. The team returns to base camp exhausted, but there's no time to rest. As soon as we, uh, we went back, two officers came to us and said, uh, Sylvie, I want you to send uh, three person from your team uh, to go to uh, La Maison du Canada, which is a Canada house, uh, because there is one missing RCMP officer who was working in Haiti at the time of the earthquake. It was a race against the clock before dark. It was difficult to see where a street was and where a building would be. You had also areas where you didn't know where the first building started and where it stopped. <laughs> Sylvie and Kramik find what they're looking for, but sadly, not what they were hoping for. Unfortunately, we were too late. The RCMP officer was dead. We had to go back to the base and without having saved him. Working in one of the worst natural disasters in the last century, Sylvie, Kramik, and the rest of the team are as yet unable to locate even one survivor amongst the rubble. And time is running out. Coming up, Kramik makes an astonishing discovery that even catches Sylvie by surprise. Sylvie Montier and her search and rescue dog, Kermique, are in Haiti, hoping to find survivors in the aftermath of a devastating earthquake. Exhausted from lengthy travel, they set to work immediately. But day one ends without locating a single trapped survivor. In such a grim scenario, even Kermique's mood suffers. Certainly for a dog that's not finding anything, working day after day can be really discouraging. I don't think it'd be any different than you playing sports, and if you never won or you never got a goal, you'd certainly lose a bit of interest or lose some heart. Chris Jorgensen is a certified dog handler who has volunteered with the Canadian Search Dog Association for 15 years. 
It's very hard on dogs and they seem to get quite down on themselves and require the handler then to boost them up and make it a game again and make it lots of fun so that the dogs don't get kind of dejected and, and run down. After a brief rest at base camp, Sylvie, Kramik and the team are back on the job early the next day with a new directive for increasingly desperate circumstances. That second day, we were told, you don't search every house. You ask information to the bystanders, whether people are missing there or whether they have heard something or they have reasons to believe that person may be still alive there. As soon as we went down, within two seconds, we had people around us saying, yes, that way, that way, that way. The pleas for help are overwhelming. The team is pulled in several directions at once. A lady said, you know, that's my neighbor and I know he's alive. We heard him this morning. So first we called out and nobody answered. Or at least we couldn't hear anything. And that's not unusual. So people that survived, the first day can call out, but by day four, they don't have the energy to call out anymore. After half an hour without an alert from her dog, Sylvie and Kramik searched the roof of the collapsed structure. So we decided to bring him up on the roof very fast, he did alert. After hours of exhausting rubble work, Sylvie and Kramik have finally pinpointed a survivor. Heavy equipment is brought in to dig him out. And though protocol dictates Sylvie and Kramik are to move on, Sylvie digs in her heels. The orders we had was you find a victim, you mark the victim, and you move on to the next one looking for a victim. That was not going to happen. We had to find people that could take him out. Sylvie goes against orders and watches over the digging to make sure the rescued man survives. We were actually waiting uh, quite uh, impatiently. It took a long time. As if the rescue protocol isn't challenging enough, now Kramik seems to have a mind of his own. Beside us, there were people that had been pulled out on the first day that was dead um, with a sheet over her. Nobody was paying attention to her, lots of fly around her. And um, Kamik started barking at her. At first, I just told him no, and he was very insistent. And he actually, at one point, pulled all the way to the end of the leash and went straight at her and bark, 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 would not stop. Kramik is seriously testing Sylvie's patience. He's supposed to pinpoint the living, not the dead. Suddenly, as I went to get my dog, and I was um, not too happy with him, I realized there were a movement under the sheet. And that person that everybody had thought was dead was not dead. Here, I have someone here. She had been pulled within the first half hour after the, uh, the earthquake by a neighbor. It was for sure she was dead. Everybody said she was dead. Nobody paid attention to her, so everybody thought she was gone. It turned out that the dog was smarter than the rest of us <laughs> because she was still alive. And the medical team started looking after her. I kept remembering what I always hear and always tell people, trust your dog. <laughs> if not for Kramik, a woman left for dead would surely have ended up that way. Kramik and Sylvie, along with their Canadian teammates, continued to fight through 30 degree heat to identify the living amongst thousands of earthquake casualties. Four days after the quake, the Canadians were still locating survivors. I think search and rescue dogs are heroes like any working dog because they'll do their job no matter what. They recognize danger and yet they will not stop unless absolutely something is there that's not possible. And I think, yes, it takes a very special individual, whether canine or person, to, uh, to go to that extent. I look at my dog and he amazes me. His intelligence, he's willing to do what I ask in terrible conditions. So, yeah, a hero. Success for a rescue dog, I would say it's finding. It doesn't matter if it's one person or a thousand of them. One person is one person that will be alive, finding a life. This is what we call the jackpot. Coming up, a border patrol dog follows his nose to a most unlikely discovery. We've just seen how Kramik's and Sylvie's search and rescue teamwork 
save precious lives in the aftermath of a major natural disaster. Next, we meet Trooper and Doug, a team trained to recognize danger before it becomes a crisis. Doug Smith has been an officer with the Canadian Border Services Agency for the past 20 years. Based out of the port of Coots, Alberta, he's worked as a detector dog handler for the past 13 years. Doug and his dedicated Black Lab Trooper provide detector dog coverage for all ports of entry into the province of Alberta from the state of Montana. Ever since I was a young boy, I always had dogs, and my father was uh, with the Calgary Police Service back in the 60s and uh, had a uh, police dog, one of the original first seven members uh, when they started. And so dogs have always been a part of our lives. When I joined Customs, it, it was an easy transition for me to, uh, to look at the dog and think that that's what I wanted to do. By the time his first canine partner retired in 2006, Doug had already been pre-training a puppy at home for a year. That puppy was Trooper, and he quickly came on stream as Doug's new partner. I guess if I had to describe Detector Dog Trooper's personality, he's very enthusiastic. He loves to work when he's working and he's in the middle of that search, he's uh, focused. It's all a game to him, so if you were always working and you didn't get paid, it wouldn't be very fun. His, his payment is by finding stuff, so I actually have to put stuff out all the time. And his reward, of course, for finding this stuff is the ball. And uh, so I'll put stuff out throughout the day to not necessarily motivate him, but keep him up, and that's his finds. The three types of dogs that we use in the Canada Border Services Agency are uh, drug and firearm dogs, and we have a currency dog, and we also have dogs that are trained for food, plants, and animals. This for your visit. Every day, thousands of travelers make their way into Canada and Trooper plays a critical role in the evaluation and examination process. In April of 2010, Trooper singles out an American traveler Search. during a routine pass of the Port of Coots lobby. When I do these sweeps, uh, if he shows interest in a, in a person inside the office, it may not be that they have something on them, but it may be there might be something in the vehicle because he's picking up that residual odor. The dogs are trained for actually odor, not necessarily the product. Sir, will you please step to the side, come with me? Motivated by Trooper's alert, Border Services Officer Trevor Slavens brings the traveler's truck and trailer in for further examination. Good boy, Trooper. Good boy. Oh. We had taken the truck and the trailer up into the examination bay and unloaded all the contents of the trailer and the contents of the truck. We unloaded most of the stuff in the vehicle and took Trooper through and ran through all the household goods. Trooper shows passing interest in several articles but officers are unable to locate any contraband. He had a few interests in some areas, and we, we searched it, and we weren't finding anything. We were close to letting that uh, vehicle go, but he, Trooper had gone to this toolbox that was in the back of the truck a couple of times, showed some good interest. Whatever is in this toolbox keeps drawing Trooper back. Finally, Doug acknowledges his dog must be onto something substantial. So at the very end, I thought, oh, we have to look in that toolbox. A cursory search turns up nothing out of the ordinary. But then, pay dirt. A closer look revealed a, a gun barrel for a prohibited uh, handgun that was inside. Got some questions here. We're going to go inside and talk. Further questioning reveals pieces of a legal handgun are planted throughout the trailer. And Trooper soon sniffs out the contraband. 
It was because of finding that barrel that uh, we were able to stop that gun from coming into Canada. Veterinarian Wendy McClellan explains why dogs are perfectly suited for this job. Dogs have an extraordinary sense of smell. Their olfactory bulb, which is the part of the brain used for smelling, is 40 times larger than humans. And they're able to detect odors at concentrations 100 million times lower than people, which makes them such an intricate part of search and rescue. Trooper's vastly superior senses, in conjunction with his unyielding dedication, make him and all the detector dogs across the country a vital part of the team protecting Canada's borders. The Canada Border Services Agency has 72 detector dog teams located across Canada. In the last two years, they have seized 30,000 kilos of narcotics, 30,000 kilos of food, plant, and animal products, $8 million worth of proceeds of crime. And also in the last two years, they have seized close to 500 firearms, in which 70% of those our handguns. Dogs like Trooper can serve a role that people and technology can't. Uh, we simply don't have the sophistication of equipment to reliably do the job that they do. Trooper and Kramik are great examples of working dogs. They're very intelligent, they're highly bonded to their owners, their work ethic is amazing, and they have a high prey drive. All these qualities make them ideal candidates, and it's very fortunate for us. You know, when you talk to kids and you do school groups, uh, you ask them, you know, how many have dogs? And they'll put up their hands and, uh, and I'll say, do you guys like playing with your dogs? And they'll say yes, and I'll go, well, you know what? They pay me to play with a dog almost every day that I go to work, so that's a pretty good job. Trooper and Doug are great examples of how human canine teamwork is a vital part of a nation's security. And while that team looks after things on the home front, Sylvie and Kramik take their special partnership around the globe, bringing hope to those who need it most. In both cases, man's best friend rises to the ranks of trusted partner, and we're all better off because of the amazing work they do. For more information, visit cmt.ca slash pet heroes.